Hey, how's it going? Thank you guys for coming to church. We're back online, unfortunately, but we're thankful to be here. Thank you to Pastor Myron uh, for inviting me to be here with you guys today and teach God's word to you. And thank you to everybody at Compassion Church. It's so great to be here. My name is Landon. I'm one of the pastors at Cornerstone Church in Chandler. And one of the things I love about Arizona, my family and I just moved here um, one year ago this month. And other than the fact that we picked the absolute worst possible time um, to move to Arizona, one of the things I love about Phoenix is that the churches are so kind to each other and they like invite each other around and trade people. And I think that that's a really great picture of the kingdom of God and of a lack of competition uh, between churches that are fighting for the same goal to show people Jesus Christ and to show them how he changes lives and to show them what he does in the world. Well, like I said, my name is Landon, and it's too bad that it's online because um, I am not an impressive uh, person to look at. But when I go and preach places for the first time, I always have my wife with me. And it's too bad that we're online because you guys won't be able to see her because I, I, I've seen the way this, this goes before. I start talking and people are like, eh, you know, okay. And then I'm like, oh, here's my wife in the front row. She stands up. She's so beautiful. And then people look at her. They're like, all right, I'll give this guy a chance. Like, all this, if, if, he got, if he got that woman to marry him, then I will uh, listen to him. And so, unfortunately, we don't have that today. But we have, uh, my wife's name is Bree. We have three kids, Ezra, Violet, and Julian, and our dog, Yoko Ono. <laughs> and uh, it's a nut house over there. Uh, so I just got a text that it, things were just going crazy over there right now. So, and, and, and we're stuck at home right now. Again. And it's one of the things that's so hard about 2020, isn't it? It's something that you never expected or you never would have believed a year ago right now that this is what would be happening. Do you know what I mean? And that it felt like for a second we were like getting out of the house and it was like all going to be over and we're like going back to school and like it's time to like rock it again. And then it's like, oh no, we're kind of headed back in the other direction. And so I was going to preach on love. I had this message that I had written on Romans chapter 8. And I was praying today, and the Lord stirred in my heart this idea that I think is the hardest idea to hold on to and grab onto in this time of quarantine and in this time that we're kind of stuck in right now. And the idea is that of contentment, of being content. All Christians are not just called, but are equipped to be and feel content in every circumstance. And I got to tell you, there's been a few moments where I've been sitting at home with a couple kids yelling in my face and uh, not a ton to do. And uh, you can only sort the garage uh, out so many times. And all of a sudden, you just feel like, I just kind of wish things were different. That's discontentment. I want to tell you today how to be and feel and live contentment in this season right now. So whether you're newly unemployed, which is very rough and it has been true for a lot of people, or whether you are working at the hospital and you're working twice as hard and you are wishing you were at home like the other people, wherever you're at, I want to talk to you today about how to be content in the circumstances that you're in. And we learn how to do that in, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 5. It says, let me read it to make sure I don't misquote it. It says, be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. If you have a Bible, that's the verse we're going to be looking at today. I'll read it again for us in just a sec if you want to turn there. Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 5. It's a pretty amazing verse, and that's our, our food. That's our spiritual food for this morning. It says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, Be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I grew up in the Midwest. I don't know if you guys have Awana around here, but it's like a Bible club for kids. I went to it every Wednesday night. This is like one of the big verses that we learned to like get a patch on our vest and like prove that we love God or whatever. And this was one of the big verses that they had us learn. Hebrews chapter 13, verse five. And the thing that's interesting is, is sometimes that for little kids, they would cut out the more intense part of the verses and just leave kind of the more just easy to di digest part. Because what the verse says before, it says the part that I quoted is, quote, keep your life free from the love of money. 
And then it says, be content. I want to focus in on that second half, though. Um, what does it mean to be content? The biblical word for contentment in this circumstance means satisfied that what you have is enough. That you would be, feel, and live satisfied that what you have already is enough. You know, it's easy to look at the verse and, and read the word not as content, but as content. That's what I'm thinking about for most of the evenings. I don't know if you are. There's so much content out there right now. You know, I, I just, there's too many TV shows. Have you noticed this? There's just, the, I, I can't even keep up with them anymore. I, there's so much content out there. Um, I'm a Lord of the Rings nerd, and Amazon just paid $250 million to make a Lord of the Rings television show. And, uh, you know, even if it's a dumpster fire, I'll guarantee you, I'll be there till the last second just drinking that up. There's just so much content, and even that plays into this idea of uh, contentment. I want to unpack that a little bit more. But contentment in Scripture means that you are satisfied that what you have is enough. If you write in your Bible, maybe write that at the top over Hebrews chapter 13. You know it's okay to write in your Bible? Go ahead and write, uh, content means satisfied that what I have is enough. I was reading this story on Reddit. I don't know if you guys use Reddit, but it's like, uh, it's like Instagram for nerds, kind of, you know? If like... Twitter is for mean people and Facebook is like for kind of ignorant people and Instagram is for like kind of self-righteous people, you know, Reddit's for the nerds. No? Okay, well, I can't tell if you're offended because we're not in the same room right now. So anyways, I was on Reddit and I was reading a story about a guy named Bill Morgan. We have a picture that we're going to put up of him right now. Bill Morgan had a pretty interesting life. He actually died in a car crash and then was brought back to life at the hospital. You know, where they're like, it like actually worked and he came back to life. And everybody's like, this guy is so lucky. Like how amazing, he died in a car crash and then they brought him back to life. And then Bill Morgan uh, liked to buy lottery tickets and one day he went to a gas station and he bought a lottery ticket and he won $17,000. I can imagine people being like, oh my gosh, I wish I was Bill Morgan. This guy gets two lives and he gets 17 grand. And here's the craziest part of the story. Bill Morgan went with a news crew to the exact same gas station because they said, hey, we want you to reenact this for the news. So just act like you won 17 grand again because they wanted to show it on the nightly news. And Bill Morgan walks in, he says, I'll have one lottery ticket. They hand it to him, he scratches it off and he starts freaking out and he's like, I won. And they turn the cameras off, they're like, wow, that was really good acting. He's like, no, I won again. And he won $250,000, reenacting him winning $17,000. And I got to tell you, when we have access to all kinds of information, when we have so much unlimited access to people's lives, contentment is so hard to find because when you go on the internet, all you can read about and find about is people like Bill Morgan, who have more than you, who are luckier than you, who have a more beautiful spouse than you do, who have a higher salary than you do, who have better looking, more talented kids than you do, who went to a better school, who got the job that you wanted to get. It's just endlessly full of stories that seem poised and positioned and created to make our hearts feel discontent. Discontent is looking at your life and saying, it's not enough. My wife's not enough. My kids are not enough. My salary's not enough. My car's not enough. My house is not enough. And I think if we're really honest about the way um, that we actually talk to ourselves, discontentment is actually often a big part of our lives, although we don't talk about it very much. That we would look at the things that we have that God has blessed us with and that we would think, feel, believe, and live. That's not enough. If I just won the lottery twice, if I just had a Tesla, if I just had a six-figure salary, if I just had the house that my brother has in Sedona, if I just had that, then I would be content. And the problem is... The reason that you don't have contentment isn't because of what you have. It's because of what you want. 
Because look at the second half of the verse. It says here, be content with what you have for what? What does it say? For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The thing that creates contentment in a Christian's heart isn't looking at the stuff you have and saying that actually is enough. Whether it's enough or whether it's not. If you're a follower of Christ, the way you get contentment isn't by looking and changing your mind about the things that you have. It's about, or the things that you want. It's about recognizing what you already have. The thing that makes Christians so content is that they believe that Jesus is everything and they have Jesus and so they have everything. And when you have everything, you don't want anything. The thing that makes Christians so content, the reason Hebrews 13, 5 is such an amazing passage, the reason that it's so true is because the people who have Jesus recognize that Jesus is everything. And when you have everything, you don't want anything. And when you don't want anything, everything that you do have is great. You don't wish you had a Tesla instead of your Honda. You don't wish you had a $600,000 house instead of a $300,000 house. You don't wish you had that wife instead of yours. You don't wish you had three sons instead of two. You don't wish you had that salary instead of the one you have. When you truly have Jesus, the way that he wants to be had by you, when you truly know, believe, and live Jesus Christ in your heart through your life, you realize that that's everything. That was the whole purpose. And when you have everything, you don't want anything. And when you don't want anything, you're content. Doesn't matter if I get the virus. Being serious. Because I have Jesus. And that's enough. Doesn't matter if I don't get the house I've been saving up for for 15 years in Sedona. Doesn't matter if I never get the promotion. Doesn't matter if my kids don't go to the same school that I went to because I loved it so much and I want that so much for them. Doesn't matter if my... I have everything. And when you have everything, you don't want anything anymore. So I guess the question then becomes, Christians, do you really know what you have? I hope that's okay for me to say. Do you really know what you have in Jesus? You know, it's interesting. The writer of Scripture here is actually quoting the Old Testament. It says, quote, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's actually quoting Joshua chapter 1, verse 5. God's talking to Joshua, and Joshua must have been just a pinch insecure because he had to be the leader after Jesus, uh, not Jesus, he had to be the leader after Moses. I don't know if you've ever taken over a department or taken over a job after somebody who did a really good job, but it's not fun. It's a lot better to take over a job after somebody did a terrible job uh, because then everyone's like, this is a disaster, and you just make it like 10% better, and everyone's like, yes, well done. But Joshua had to take over uh, 2 million people who had been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, who had the best leader of all time, who stood on a mountaintop and, and looked at God face to face in a cloud. And God wanted to assure him that, that he would have what Moses had. And so he said this amazing promise to him. He said, Joshua, I'm never going to leave you. And not only am I never going to leave you, I'm never going to forsake you. Because sometimes there's people who don't leave, but they've kind of left emotionally. They're still with you, but like not. God's saying, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stay with you. And I'm going to stay for you. And the amazing thing is that the writer of Hebrews, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says that that promise is not only a promise to Joshua, but it's a promise to you. He said, remember what God said. I will always be with you. And I will never forsake you. I will always be with you and I will always be for you. I don't know if you grew up in a, a fundamentalist type of Christian circle like I did, but 
When you grow up in places like that, often people have a very pejorative view of scripture, which means that when they look at Old Testament promises, they often will say something to the effect of, you know, this doesn't apply to Christians now, or someone will post Jeremiah 29 11 with like a garden picture on their Facebook. And then like the truth train guy will show up underneath and be like, don't you understand hermeneutics? Like this verse doesn't, this verse doesn't apply to you. Are you in exile though? Um, <laughs> and I think there's something really awesome about not looking at scripture like that because Scripture doesn't look at itself like that. The Bible doesn't look at itself like that. We see this here, that the Bible takes a, an Old Testament quote that was meant for Joshua, a guy who died a long time before we were ever born. And the Holy Spirit said, uh, remember this. Remember this promise. I won't ever leave you. I won't ever forsake you. There's something unbelievable about that, especially coming on the tail end of the book of Hebrews. I don't know if you know what happens in the book of Hebrews, but it's basically like this. Starts out, they're like, Jesus is greater than everything. And they're like, Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is greater than angels. Jesus is greater than the Old Testament. Jesus is greater than the sacrificial system. And everyone's like, we get it. And then at the end, he's like, and this Jesus, this great being, he is with you right now. And he won't leave you. And if you'll just allow me to call your heart back to what that means. That the one who brought redemption to the world. The one who looked at the cross and said, that's not too much. The one who did it. The one who satisfied God's wrath. The one who satisfied 1,400 years of sacrifices of lambs every Passover the one who, when he was nailed to the cross, said, it is finished. And when he said that, all punishment for all people of all time who would believe in him, that's what he was talking about. It is finished. The, the, that guy is with you. And I know we know that. But I wonder if sometimes when we've been a Christian for a long time, we take the things that we know and they just kind of exist up here and, and they kind of started out down here, but then they make this kind of little trip that makes them less exciting and less potent. And then they kind of just like stay up here. Do you know what I mean? And then it's like, it's not something that you really feel that much anymore. It's just something that you know, like an obligatory I love you to a family member that you haven't thought about since last Thanksgiving and won't think about until next Thanksgiving. You do love them, but like only kind of. And I wonder if that thing has kind of trickled up from down here. And I wonder if this morning God would just uh, invite you to just grab that and pull it back down from the knowing into the feeling place that God stuffed himself inside of human skin and had to like do all of the stupid stuff that we have to do. And not only did he become one of us, but he saved us. And not only did he save us, but he's with us. There's something there when you're alone in quarantine on day, Lord help us, please let it not get to day 100. But if, if you're there knowing and believing and feeling that Jesus Christ is with you is the thing that brings about contentment. When you know that he's with you, when you know that he won't leave you, and when you have a full knowledge and understanding of who he is, not as a historical character, but as a friend, as a brother, as a... a, a, a a, a confidant in life, as a person who's with you going through life, when you have that, when you know that, but when you believe it and when you feel it, and, and then you just can't look at anything in your life with discontentment because you can't have discontentment because you have Jesus and Jesus is everything. And when you have everything, you don't want anything. And I recognize that it's hard for some of us to believe that people won't leave. Some of us had dads who left. 
Some of us had spouses who left. Boyfriend, girlfriend who left. You thought it was the one and it turned out to be no one. And that's hard. And that shapes our ability to look at the present um, in the spiritual way that God wants us to. And for some of us, maybe if we were truly honest, the person who left, it was our fault. Maybe you cheated on your first husband and he left and you couldn't even blame him. There's something so amazing about the fact that Jesus knows everything about us and he still promises to be with us and to be for us. I gotta tell you, I wouldn't want you to see me in my worst moments in my 32 years on earth, and I assuredly wouldn't wanna see you in your worst moment, but in your worst moment, Jesus saw it, and he still stood by the words that he said, I won't ever leave you or forsake you. I will be with you and I will be for you. And there's something so powerful about not just knowing that, but about believing it and feeling it. And once you feel it, it, it lets itself out in your life as contentment. And then you look at your life and you're like, you know, I might not ever get a Tesla. I might not ever get, I don't know, what does is, what is Gen Z want? Like a Supreme sweatshirt and Yeezys or something? I don't know. I might not ever get this stuff. But I already have everything. And when you have everything, you don't want anything. I read a, another story on the internet. This one was not on Reddit, though. It was just on a news website. And it was about a woman named uh, Victoria Ravolo. And as a contrast to Bill Morgan from before, the lottery guy, this, this lady had a pretty rough go of it. She uh, was driving on the highway one day in the fast lane. And a, I think, eight or 10 pound frozen turkey crashed through her windshield and hit her in the face. It's a real story. You can look it up. It's, it's a terrible story. There was a bunch of boys in a car going the other way and they were just goofing around. They bought this turkey and they threw it out the window, not thinking about what they were doing. And it crashed through the windshield of uh, Victoria's car and hit her in the face and shattered her entire face. She had to have reconstructive surgery on her entire face. They had to put wire metal meshing around one of her eyes to hold her face together. And then they um, stapled what was left of her face uh, back on. And the reason that I'm telling you that is because when we're talking about contentment, I think it's easy to look at a story like Bill Morgan's, the lottery guy, and be like, if I had that, I would be content. Or to look at a story like Victoria's and be like, oh my gosh, how could a person who ever had that happen be content? And the truth is, is that the vast majority of us are going to live our entire lives in between those two stories. It may not ever get as good from a world, worldly perspective as, as Bill's story, and it may not ever get as bad from a worldly perspective as Victoria's story. But remember what Paul said in Philippians chapter four, he said, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, he says, I have learned the secret. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And he wrote that from prison. I know some of us feel like we're imprisoned in our houses right now. Just leave it there. There's something so awesome about the way Paul chose contentment and the way the writer of Hebrews is telling us, no matter what situation you're in, no matter what circumstance you're in, you can be content. You might not have the greatest home life right now, you can be content because you have Jesus. You might not have the greatest marriage. You can be content because you have Jesus. You might not have the salary you thought you'd get or the car you thought you'd get or any of the possessions that you thought you'd get or still even want, but you can be content because you have Jesus. And when you recognize that Jesus is everything, not just up here, but, but, but down here, when you recognize that Jesus is everything, you don't want anything because you already have everything. I'd love to pray with you for a couple minutes. Lord, thank you that uh, when we preach your word, when we talk about your son, we can feel the presence of the Holy Spirit uh, working, even though we're not in the same location right now, God. And I, I believe um, by the power of Jesus that the Holy Spirit is working and, and helping and lifting and doing all of the things that you promised that the Holy Spirit would do. And so, God, as we pray right now, we're just leaning in and we're saying, God, would you show us in our specific circumstance how to be content? 
Would you show us the things that we superficially want and, and not out of guilt to let them go and not act like we don't want them, but to see that we already have something better than what we want? Would you show that to us, God? Would you show us how to do it? Because I'll be honest, a lot of times I've uh, gone and listened to a sermon and I was like, oh, that sounds cool. And then I leave and I don't really do it and I don't ask you to do it, but we're asking you to do this. We're asking you that you would bear the fruit of contentment in our hearts. We're asking that we, the Christian listeners of this uh, 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 sermon and service, that you would show us how to be content in the person and work of Jesus Christ. That we would not just believe that you are present, but that we would feel and know that you are present. And in that presence, God, that we would see that we already have something better than what we wanted. Would we not live our life saying, oh, I'm a Christian, I can't want that. Oh, I'm a Christian, I can't uh, desire that. Would we say to ourselves, I'm a Christian, I already have something better than that. I already have something better than a Tesla. I already have something better than a, that closet. I already have something better than what I perceive that other person has based on their Instagram stories that I'm judging from my own perspective. I already have something that's better than that. Would you show us that this Jesus, this person that we have that lives with us, that lives in us through the power of the Holy Spirit, that lives on us, that covers us, that's given us a mission and, and a weight of glory and a deposit of the Holy Spirit, would we see that this person um, not only do we have that person and not only are they with us but they are for us and not only is Jesus for us but Jesus is everything and when you have everything you don't want anything would you show us that that's true I pray that not one person who's listening would force their mind onto this out of sheer will and say I have to make this real in my life and, and do this that's just religion God I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would bear this fruit in us, that we would see that Jesus is everything, that from our hearts, we could say that as something that we mean, not a religious phrase that we know other people wanna hear, something we heard in the sermon, but something that we believe, something that we feel, something that we live, something that we have, something that we trust, something that is, and that through that belief, that you would bear the fruit of contentment in us. And we would look around our house, our family, our job, our life, and say, I have everything I need because I have Jesus. And because I have Jesus, I don't need anything. And that we could truly from our hearts be thankful for what we do have and exhibit this amazing um, Christian virtue of contentment. And so we're praying this now um, for the glory of Jesus, uh, to the praise of the Father by the power of the Spirit uh, from your word. Um, in, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.